In this video, we'll be discussing about the cornea. So the anatomy of the cornea is important. Okay, all the various layers of the cornea, sometimes questions may be asked about them. But one important thing which everybody needs to know is uh, about the factors responsible for con uh, corneal transparency. So first of all, the cornea does not have blood vessels. It does not have myelinated nerve endings. It has free nerve endings which are unmyelinated and it has no lymphatics. So no blood vessels, no myelinated nerve endings and no lymphatics. All these are important for corneal transparency. Next, the cornea does not have any antigen presenting cells. Okay, the central cornea does not have any APCs. Next, limbal stem cells. So these LSCs, they prevent the conjunctiva from encroaching onto the cornea. So all of these, they make sure that the cornea stays clear and transparent. Then the cornea has non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So there is no keratin. So again, the cornea stays clear. Then between these epithelial cells, there are tight junctions that prevent the tear film from coming in and causing any corneal edema. So that is why the cornea, it stays uh, clear because there is no corneal edema. Next, the Bowman's layer integrity must be maintained. If it is not intact, if there is any trauma or ulcer, there is a scar and then that leads to a permanent opacity. Okay, so the intactness of the Bowman's membrane also uh, helps in cor maintaining corneal transparency. Next, the stromal collagen fibers are regularly oriented. This regular orientation is very important because the distance between two collagen fibrils is lambda by two, where lambda is the wavelength of light. Okay, this is very important. Next, there are proteoglycans that absorb the water to maintain the relatively dehydrated state of the stroma. Next, keratocytes or the corneal cells are very few in number and contain crystallins. Okay, they help in maintaining the optical clarity of the cornea. Next, the corneal endothelium has sodium potassium pumps that pump out water from the stroma into the aqueous. They require normal intraocular pressure to work and also in adequate endothelial cell density. Okay, so these corneal endothelial pumps, the sodium potassium pumps, also they pump out the excess water and thereby ensure that any corneal edema does not occur. So they maintain the corneal clarity. Next, corneal ulcer. This is a very important essay question. Anything may be asked. So there is a discontinuity of corneal epithelium along with adjacent stromal infiltration or necrosis. Okay. So pathogenesis. So there are four stages. Stage of progressive infiltration, active ulceration, regression and cicatrization. So in the stage of progressive infiltration, first of all, you have all these bacteria that are coming in. So again, inflammatory cells come in to counteract that bacterial action. So inflammatory cells, they come from the peripheral capillaries and the stroma. So infiltration occurs first followed by necrosis. Necrosis depends on two factors. How virulent is the organism or the pathogen and how powerful is the host? So the immunity of the host. This immunity can be again local and systemic immunity. Okay, so in the stage of active ulceration, there is ulceration followed by necrosis. Okay, this necrosis is followed by sloughing of the epithelium, uh, Bowman's membrane and the stroma. Okay, so here in the stage of active ulceration, you can see swollen overhanging edges with sloughed floor, okay, with slough on the floor. So again, what what is clinically apparent? So clinically, you can see hyperemia on the conjunctiva. It can be circumcorneal or circumciliary congestion. The cornea is hazy. There is iris because there is active ulceration here. The cornea is hazy. There is iritis. So iritis, whenever there is inflammation of the iris, there is exudation into the anterior chamber. Okay, so there can be hypopion. It can spread horizontally and vertically. Okay, it increases in depth. Okay, it might result in perforation of the ulcer. Then once the active ulceration ends, there is regression. So this is because of host immunity, humoral and cellular and because of the treatment that is provided. So you can see a demarcation line. So inflammatory cells, uh, they cause phagocytosis of the epithelial debris and there are antigen antibody uh, complexes. There seems to be an apparent increase in the size of the ulcer because all these uh, immune cells, they phagocytose the extra debris. So before there was debris here, but once that has been cleared out because of phagocytosis, it looks like the ulcer is apparently increasing in size. Okay. Then there is superficial vascularization again to promote healing and epithelialization of the ulcer from the edges. This is followed by the stage of cicatrization. So epithelial growth, again, the turnover is seven days and fibrous tissue is laid down, which includes new collagen. So this is laid down by stromal keratocytes or the fibroblasts and the endothelium of the new vessels. All of these, they proliferate. See, if only the epithelium is involved, it heals without any opacity. But if the Bowman's membrane is damaged, you have nebula. Bowman's membrane plus less than one third of the stroma is involved, it is macula. Bowman's membrane plus one third, greater than one third of the stroma is involved, it is leukoma. And following perforation, if there is incarceration of the uveal tissue or the iris or something like that, there is adherent leukoma. Okay. These are the grades of corneal opacity. Some books say it is half, some books say it is one third. In my notes, I've written it as one third.
you can just draw this diagram to represent this sometimes the grading of corneal opacity is asked next fate of the corneal ulcer it can see if it is a localized ulcer it can heal if it is uh, or it can get perforated if the pathogen is more powerful and the immune system immunity is less and it can form a sloughing corneal ulcer also so what are the clinical features of corneal ulcer or keratitis see there is photophobia because the expo uh, the, the exposed corneal nerves are stimulated there is irritation okay when these nerves are exposed to the outer environment so there is photophobia next again whenever there is irritation in the eye you have watering or lacrimation watering is a symptom lacrimation is a sign redness is a symptom circumcorneal or circumciliary congestion is the sign next again blurring of the vision due to the corneal haze and pain because of ciliary muscle spasm so what are the signs again reactionary lid edema can be there blepharospasm can be there conjunctiva there can be again ccc cornea you, you see you can have a yellowish white ulcer with a grayish white infiltrate surrounding it these inflammatory cells okay so the walls are swollen and overhanging and the floor contains a slough of necrotic material in the anterior chamber there can be hypopion iris again iritis this results in a muddy iris appearance and iop you can have secondary open angle glaucoma because of the inflammation so coming to the management see any corneal ulcer be it bacterial fungal viral or uh, parasitic uh, you, you this is common okay so first you do the clinical evaluation first management includes both the investigations and the treatment okay don't just write treatment uh, when they when they ask about management so first start with history taking okay then general uh, physical examination followed by an ocular examination in the ocular examination first do the ad adnexal examination examine the lids the lacrimal sac by regurgitation test and syringing of the lacrimal passages to rule out any chronic dacrocystitis the most common cause is again streptococcus pneumonia then measure the corneal sensations because in viral keratitis neurotrophic keratitis and metaherpetic keratitis the corneal sensations are decreased there itself you can get an idea that it could be of viral etiology or something like that then the slit lamp examination okay you use vital dye such as fluorescein which is an orange dye it stains the epithelial defect so whenever there is an epithelial defect in the cornea when you use fluorescein it stains that part yellowish green or opaque green okay so what all do you see on slit lamp examination you see the site shape size s3 depth and margins dm and fe floor and vascularization all these are what you see in the slit lamp examination then moving on to the laboratory investigations again you do a blood test rbs or a cbc okay next corneal scraping with topical anesthetic which is preservative free okay so you do the corneal scrapings using kimura spatula or baird parker handle uh, bp num bp handle number 15 okay so basically you do this before any topical antibiotic is given okay you can use these corneal scrapings for culture you can culture them okay you can do a koh examination on them all this so stop antibiotics for 12 hours before the scraping and then do the scraping okay so if there is severe infection take the scraping without stopping the antibiotic only if there is very severe infection so procedure give the topical anesthetic preservative free okay clear off the slough or necrotic material scrape the margins and the floor gently and then start the topical antibiotic therapy so scrapings again you can do gram stain if you are suspecting any bacterial etiology culture and sensitivity and you can change the agar if you are suspecting neisseria you can use blood agar or chocolate agar because it is very fastidious and you can use the scrapings for pcr analysis as well you can do a koh mount if you are suspecting any fungus and culture it on sour or dextrose agar if you are again suspecting a fungal etiology acanthamoeba if you are suspecting then you can do gms stain lpcb stain lactophenol cotton blue acrid and orange stain or even you can use calcofloor white as well the culture media for acanthamoeba is an important point so you use non nutrient agar enriched with e coli okay so moving on to the treatment in common for any corneal ulcer see specific treatment you will give that topically all right if it is bacterial you will give antibacterials antifungals for fungal corneal ulcer all that non specific treatment see you are going to give topical cycloplegics because see uh it relieves the pain it causes ciliary paralysis the cili ciliary spasm is imp uh, is one cause for pain in uh, in a corneal ulcer case so because you are paralyzing the ciliary muscles you relieve the pain so you are using topical cycloplegics and because of the midriatic action these topical cycloplegics they prevent the formation of synechia the posterior synechia and they break the newly formed synechia next they bring in more antibodies because they increase the blood flow by relieving pressure on the anterior ciliary artery by uh, again relieving the ciliary spasm and they decrease the capillary hyperpermeability okay so all of this is important so atropine homatropine cyclopentolate and tropicamide 
and again you use vitamin c topically or systemically because it increases the collagen synthesis and promotes healing and again you can give oral doxycycline as well because uh matrix metalloproteases so mmps they cause corneal thinning so in order to increase the healing you don't want the cornea to thin out so you use doxycycline to inhibit these mmps and general supportive measures include dark glasses hot uh, fermentation and high protein diet okay moving on to specific uh, causes so bacterial corneal ulcer see bacterial co corneal ulcer with hypopion is different from a hypopion corneal ulcer okay so just uh, look at the differences in corona properly next uh, bacterial corneal ulcer with uh, see hypopion corneal ulcer most probably refers to pneumococcus in most cases it just refers to pus in anterior chamber hypopion is nothing but pus in the anterior chamber bacterial corneal ulcer with hypopion you have staphylococcus marexella pseudomonas gonococcus all this so look, let's look at the mechanism of hypopion formation. So whenever there is toxic iridocyclitis, there is exudation in itis, there is inflammation. So there are inflammatory cells which then enter into the anterior chamber. Okay, these inflammatory cells which have entered the anterior chamber, they gravitate and settle. Okay, here in the anterior chamber, which enter the aqueous, they enter, they settle in the anterior chamber. Okay. So that is why you have hypopion here. Bacterial hypopion is sterile. Always remember that in bacterial hypopion, it is the inflammatory cells which are settling down and forming the hypopion. So when you are culturing the inflammatory cells, there are no bacteria that can grow on the agar and give you a culture. Okay. So pneumococcal corneal ulcer, it is also called ulcus serpents or ulcer serpents. So it is a grayish or yellowish oval corneal ulcer and it is a creeping corneal ulcer. Okay. So the active end it keeps creeping and the tail is the healing end okay so it is a rapidly spreading ulcer and it usually perforates okay because it is so active and uh, so it is very active and then it is also called a creeping corneal ulcer or a serpiginous corneal ulcer okay so again treatment specific treatment is again for a bacterial corneal ulcer you give topical fortified antibiotics eye drops only so they give gram positive and gram negative coverage because of the fortification so fortified cefazolin 5% plus fortified topramycin 1.3% or cefazolin plus vancomycin or vancomycin plus any fourth generation fluoroquinolones one important thing which you need to remember for bacterial corneal ulcer treatment is the frequency of installation of eye drops. So every 5 minutes for 30 minutes, every 30 minutes for 2 hours, you know, all the sequence that is important in Kurana. Next, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it causes contact, uh, sorry, corneal ulcer in contact lens wearers. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, cor corneal ulcer in contact lens wearers. This is an important MCQ bit. So it is a rapidly spreading ulcer. It, uh, it usually perforates. Okay. Uh, there is a greenish discharge. Again, Pseudomonas has its own pigments. So organisms that penetrate intact corneal epithelium are, you don't need to have any corneal disturbance. Okay. Even if the epithelium is proper and intact also, these organisms can penetrate that. So the mnemonic is she nicely influences cornelis. So Shigella, Neisseria, Haemophilus influenza influences uh, Corinibacterium diphtheriae and Listeria monocytogenes. Next, uh, again, st uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis is the most common cause of corneal ulcer after keratoplasty or LASIK. And uh, S. viridens, again, it causes infectious uh, crystalline keratopathy. Okay, needle shaped crystals in the stroma, corneal stroma. Then perforated corneal ulcer. So what are the risk factors for perforation? If the organism is very virulent, okay, if there is local immunosuppression, okay, or if there is any forneal, uh, foreign body on the cornea, or if there is increased IOP. So natural history. So what happens is the ulcer sloughs and gets deeper and deeper, deeper. The ulcer base reaches the decimates membrane. Next, whenever the IOP increases when you sneeze or cough or strain, what happens is there is a stage of decimetocele, okay? There is impending corneal perforation. The decimet, the decimates membrane bulges out like this. And then finally, there is corneal perforation. So what happens to perforated corneal ulcer? See, if the perforation is small, the iris plugs the defect, causing an adherent glaucoma. But if the iris does not plug it, there is a corneal fistula. So how can you detect a corneal fistula? You use fluorescent dye and you do what is called a Siddell's test. See, the aqueous keeps leaking if there is a corneal fistula. So because the aqueous keeps leaking, the fluorescence which you see when you use fluorescein, it keeps getting diluted because of the leakage of aqueous. Okay, this is called quenching of the fluorescent dye. Next, if the defect is large, the perforation is large, the iris prolapses out. Okay, then there is an organization of exudates into a fibrous membrane and there is epithelialization over this iris. Okay, there is a pseudocornea formation. Okay, that leads to anterior staphyloma. 
Next, management again. You need to prevent the perforation or manage the desmetacil, which is a stage of impending corneal perforation. Corneal perforation has not occurred yet, but it is about to occur. It is impending. So avoid increased IOP first. Avoid sneezing, coughing, etc. And treat the constipation. Okay. Next, uh, again, if there, uh, try to decrease the IOP. Use IV mannitol, acetazolamide, timolol, and do paracentesis if possible. Then again, pressure bandage, soft contact lens or bandage contact lens. You use conjunctival flaps again to cover the defect, amniotic membrane graft, corneal transplantation to a tectonic keratoplasty to strengthen the cornea or you use cyanoacrylate glue. But if the corneal ulcer has already perforated, if it is small, just use glue, cyanoacrylate glue. Okay, uh, so again, you can use soft bandage contact lens. If the defect is large, amniotic membrane grafting or penetrating keratoplasty, which is full thickness keratoplasty, you are replacing the full thickness of the cornea by using a donor's cornea. Okay, next, complication of perforated corneal ulcer. What are they? See, there can be corneal scarring leading to aderent leukoma, corneal fistula, anterior staphyloma, iris prolapse, anterior subluxation of the lens. Okay, the lens itself can subluxate. Next, the anterior polar cataract can occur if the lens touches the perforation, if it exudates and the toxin is the touch there. Endophthalmitis, panophthalmitis, and vitreous hemorrhage, expulsive choroidal hemorrhage, decreased IOP, all this. Moving on to fungal corneal ulcer or keratomycosis. Kerato refers to the cornea and mycosis refers to the fungi. So, definition again, that's common. See, the causative organisms, you can divide them into filamentous fungi, yeasts, and dimorphic organisms. So filamentous, again, you have septate and aseptate organisms. So aseptate organisms, you have members of the mucorrhils order. So mucor, rhizopus, all of them. Okay. And then septate organisms, you have aspergillus, fusarium, penicillium, all this. Yeast, candida, cryptococcus, commonly. Dimorphic, you have histoplasma, blastomyces, all of them. All of them. Next, risk factor. See, any fungal infection, obviously diabetes mellitus is a risk factor. Risk factor. HIV is a risk factor for infections like candida and stuff and again steroids they cause immunosuppression so immunosuppression is a very important risk factor for fungal disease anywhere in the body next locally if there is any usage of chronic topical steroids or neurotrophic keratitis so that causes a local immunosuppression that leads to fungal keratitis next injury so injury with vegetable matter or animal tail so any vegetative matter is very important so especially you have farmers coming in saying that you know an animal has hit them in the eye the tail or something or you know some grass has fell in their eyes or something like that especially in the harvesting season so that is an important risk factor for fungi because agricultural fungi all this penicillium etc it is very common in those settings see in temperate areas yeasts are more common but in tropical areas filamentous fungi are more common so what are the clinical features? See, it is important to remember in fungal keratitis that the signs are out of proportion to the symptoms. Okay, so there is very long back history of something happening such as an animal tail hitting him in the eye and after a long time you get fungal corneal ulcer. So there's photophobia, watering or lacrimation, redness or CCC, circumcorneal congestion, pain and decreased vision. So what is the morphology? See, I like to remember the fungal corneal ulcer simply as leathery, feathery. Okay, so filamentous. If you see a filamentous ulcer, See, it is ill-defined, feathery margins, dry looking, leathery, satellite lesions are there, but they're mostly seen with acanth uh, mostly seen in fungal, but also seen with acanthamoeba as well. See, in yeast, you don't have feathery margins, okay? Uh, you have collar button stuffs and all that, so that you can learn. And next, you also have fungal hypopan, you have fungal hypopan, okay? See, these fungal hyphae, they penetrate the intact desmets membrane as well. And you also have fungal hypopan, as with bacterial hypopan, but the problem, but the thing is, Unlike a bacterial hypopion, the fungal hypopion, the mnemonic is FIT, F-I-T, fungal is FIT. So fixed, infected, immobile and thick. See, it is infected because these fungal hyphae are present in the hypopion. So when you culture them, there are fungal elements which grow and uh, produce fungal colonies on the agar. The fungal hypopion is fixed and it is immobile and it is thick. Okay, next. You have endothelial plaques that form. There is an immune ring of antigen antibody complexes in the stroma and the hypopan again is fit. Okay. So again, management. So investigations, the clinical examination, all that what we have discussed previously applies here as well. Then for any fungal infection, you do a KOH mount. You take the corneal scrapings, put some KOH to digest all the ex uh, unnecessary shit there. So then you can see the fungal hyphae or the fungal uh, or the yeast cells or something like that. Then again, subrods dextrose agar is what you do for culture sensitivity. And again, you do PCR analysis as well. Corneal biopsy, parasynthesis, you do that rarely. And you can in 
to visualize the fungi, the fungal hyphae, all that in vivo. So you use co uh, confocal microscopy. So specific treatment, see medical treatment, you have, you can divide that into topical and systemic therapy. So topical therapy, again, you can divide that into filamentous and yeasts. Filamentous fungi give natamycin 5% eye drops. It is a drug of choice. So yeasts topically give amphotericin B 0.15% or voriconazole. Systemic uh, infections, again, ketoconazole uh, for filamentous fungi and fluconazole for candida. Surgical, you can do a therapeutic keratoplasty. Okay, before giving the eye drops, you can just remove the debris. The you can do debridement, so that would be useful. So you have newer drugs such as posaconazole and voriconazole. You can give voriconazole intrastromally or intracamerally as well. You have echinocandins, which inhibit the beta glucan synthesis in the cell walls. So you have caspofungin and mycofungin 0.2% eye drops. You also have something called PAC, which is photoactivated chromophore for infectious keratitis. Okay. You can also uh, use rose bengal dye and do photodynamic therapy, so PDT. Next, viral keratitis. Viral keratitis is also an important essay question. The hallmark of viral keratitis is a decrease in corneal sensations. The causative organisms are HSV type 1, herpes zoster virus, adenovirus 8, 19 and 37. So keratitis, it can be primary or it can be uh, recurrent. So primary HSV keratitis, it is usually primary blepharoconjunctivitis, the lid and the conjunctiva are involved. In recurrent lesions, the virus gets into the nerve, it goes into the gasserian ganglion in the Meckel's cave and then gets reactivated later on because of any stimulus, comes down, causes recurrent infection. So you can have epithelial involvement, so in the form of superficial punctate keratitis, dendritic ulcers, amoeboid geographic ulcers, okay, all these ulcers can be there in the epithelium. Then in the stromal layer, you can have stromal necrotic ulcer and disciform keratitis under the stroma, so type 4 delayed hypersensitivity, it is a type of that. Okay, then you can also have metaherpetic or neurotrophic keratitis, again they, there the trigeminal nerve is involved, epithelial involvement, so you can have SPK, superficial punctate keratitis, the epithelium is involved, so again you can do fluorescein test, okay, you see punctate lesions with decreased corneal sensitivity sensations next uh, dendritic ulcers see dendrites you have true dendrites and pseudodendrites true dendrites they have a terminal bulb or a knob you see that in hsv lesions whereas pseudodendrites they don't have a terminal bulb or a knob so you see that in hzv lesions uh, herpes zoster next uh, geographic or amoeboid ulcers so you have dots you have dashes such as dendrites and then you have spots such as geographic or amoeboid ulcers okay so again, uh, treatment, so you use topical antivirals 5 times a day dose, so topical acyclovir 3% ointment, topical gancyclovir 0.5% eye ointment or gel. Next, stromal involvement, again you have numular keratitis and disciform keratitis. So numular keratitis, you have coins, numer okay, so coin-like deposits of antigen antibody complexes and disciform keratitis, just like a disc-like, uh, disc-shaped stromal edema. So basically, whenever there are keratitic precipitates on the endothelium, there is endothelitis and then this is followed by disc-shaped stromal edema from inside to outside, okay? Okay, and at the same time, this endothelitis spreads to form trabeculitis and this causes increased IOP. So there is a viral ring of, uh, viral immune ring of Wesley at the stroma because of antigen-antibody complexes. So the drug of choice here in stromal keratitis is uh, topical steroids okay because viruses are there you have to give steroids under an antiviral cover of course next stromal necrotic keratitis see when the whenever there is necrosis okay you can see in slit lamp that what is supposed to be like this this slit looks necrotic it kind of looks like it's melting okay so you can see superficial vascularization so again oral antivirals and acyclovir 800 mg five times a day Next, metaherpetic keratitis. It is also called neurotropic keratitis, but some books say both are different. So you can follow the books. And no active virus is involved. So basically, the virus, it destroys the nerves. And then neurotroph uh, neurotropic factors, they are not secreted. These neurotrophic factors are uh, responsible for uh, proper repair and growth of the nerve. So then there is unhealthy epithelium. This causes non-healing corneal ulcer with smooth edges. At the same time, because of these uh, epitheliotoxic antivirals, because of the antiviral therapy, they cause toxic damage to the epithelium. This results in unhealthy epithelium again. So treatment, conservative treatment is using preservative free uh, lubricants or eye drops and soft contact lens, uh, soft bandage contact lens. Surgery again, you can do tarsorephy, amniotic membrane graft, penetrating keratoplasty, etc. 
and then newer drugs include senegermin which is a recombinant neurotrophic factor drug okay another important question is herpes zoster of thalamicus so the ca uh, causative organism is varicella zoster virus so pathogens is again re reactivation of latent virus in the gasserian ganglion so what are the triggers for reactivation you have sunlight exposure laser or lasik emotional stress menstruation and even fever so the virus once it gets reactivated it migrates down the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve so what are the risk factors decreased cellular immunity old age immunosuppression hiv malignancies etc so the clinical features you can remember it as the prodrome the skin lesions and the ocular lesions so ocular lesions you can remember in uh, three stages so acute chronic and recurrent ocular lesions so acute lesions within 3 weeks so what what all can you see see anterior segment here you can see just draw this diagram okay starting with the lids you can see redness edema and vesicular eruptions over the lids angle and iop secondary open angle glaucoma look at the iris iris you can see iritis there is sectoral iris atrophy okay there is vesicular eruption sectoral iris atrophy next corneal sensations virus so decreased or even absent next you can see hutchinson signs because nasociliary nerve supplies both the uh, cornea and the uh, tip of the nose so if you have lesions at the tip of the nose it means that the cornea is involved okay so that is hutchinson's sign next you can have punctate epithelial lesions microdendrites pseudodendrites numular keratitis or even disciform keratitis then in the posterior segment you can see acute retinal necrosis or optic neuritis and again cns lesions you can have cranial nerve palsy most commonly third nerve palsy oculomotor nerve palsy okay then again chronic uh, ocular lesions they last up to 10 years so ptosis skin vesicles when they heal they cause scarring then you can have entropion which is inward rotation of the lid margin okay the lid margin rotates inwards so it keeps irritating the cornea next uh, trichiasis which is uh, called which is like the misdirection of the eyelashes okay next you can have numular keratitis disciform and metaherpetic keratitis all this and postherpetic neuralgia in 50% of cases recurrent ocular lesions again you have iritis secondary open angle glaucoma cornea numular keratitis mucous plaque keratitis sclera scleritis etc so management of hz dog and medical and surgical medical again systemic you have antivirals so acyclovir valcyclovir fam uh, famcyclovir steroids again you use them to decrease or prevent the postherpetic neuralgia you use them in case of optic neuritis and cranial nerve palsy and again you use nsaids to decrease the pain okay start them within 72 hours of the lesion okay next uh, topical uh, drugs you have antivirals you have steroids you have to use cycloplegics antibiotics as well to prevent the secondary infection lubricants preservative free ones obviously and bandage contact lens surgical you can do tarsography amniotic membrane grafting uh, per penetrating keratoplasty and all that all right moving on to acanthamoeba keratitis the causative organism is acanthamoeba castellani it is ubiquitous it is free living in the soil it is unicellular okay so basically you can just draw the life cycle like this i don't need to explain it much so what are the risk factors again contact lens uh, when you clean it with uh, unhygienic water so with saline or tap water if you use it for long uh, long periods of time so extended wear contact lens or bathing or swimming with contact lens okay another thing that is common with contact lens wearers is pseudomonas uh, causing corneal ulcer bacterial corneal ulcer next swimming history of rec recent swimming in ponds or lakes because this acanthamoeba it is common in uh, unhygienic water bodies next vegetable matter trauma but that mostly occurs with in, in case of fungal uh, corneal ulcer so clinical features symptoms and signs see here symptoms are out of proportion to signs okay there is excruciating pain okay photophobia watering redness blurred vision blepharospasm symptoms are more in case of uh, uh, parasitic keratitis acanthamoeba keratitis but signs are more in case of fungal keratitis so signs again symptoms are more but signs are less in case of acanthamoeba keratitis so signs you can see radial perineuritis with ring stromal infiltrates everything is like like, uh, like a ring here so radial perineuritis ring stromal cellular infiltrates okay pseudodendrites necrotizing stromal keratitis ring stromal abscess and limbitis the limbus limbitis okay so again managements so first investigations do the corneal scraping do lpcb stain acrid and orange calcofluor white stain all that okay you can see the amoeba 
नेक्स्ट कल्चर इट विथ कल्चर मीडियम नॉन न्यूट्रिएंट अगर विथ ई कोलाई ओवरले एंड देन यूज पेज इज सेलेन एज द ट्रांसपोर्ट मीडियम डू पी सी आर एस वेल इफ यू आर वेरी श्योर ऑफ इट एंड जस्ट टू बी श्योर ऑफ इट नेक्स्ट यू कैन ऑल्सो डू कॉर्नियल बायोपसी सो इफ देर इज डीप स्ट्रोमल इन्वॉल्वमेंट देन ओनली यू डू कॉर्नियल बायोपसी सो वॉट डू यू डू हेच एंड ई स्टेन एस एंड हेमटॉक्सिलन स्टेन गोमोरी मैथेनोम स्टेन और पास स्टेन यू कैन यू कैन यूज दम कॉन्फोकल माइक्रोस्कोपी अगेन ओनली टू विजुअलाइज द ऑर्गेनिजम इन वीवो सो यू कैन सी द सिस्ट्स विच आर राउंड डबल वर्ल्ड एंड हाइपर रिफ्लेक्टिव ओके ट्रीटमेंट अगेन सो कंजर्वेटिव ट्रीटमेंट मेडिकल अगेन डिब्राइड द डेब्री फर्स्ट यूज टॉपिकल अमीबिसाइड्स फॉर अकेंथमीबा सो यू हैव बाइगोनाइड्स विच इनहिबिट द सेल वॉल फंक्शन फॉर्मेशन सो यू हैव पी एच एम बी पॉली हेक्सा मेथल बाइगोनाइड विच इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस एंड यू कैन यूज क्लर हेक्सीडीन एज वेल दैन यू हैव डायामिडीन विच इनहिबिट द डी एन ए सिंथेसिस सो प्रोपामिडीन हेक्सामिडीन एंड पेंटामिडीन एंड देन यू हैव टू यूज टॉपिकल एंटीबायोटिक्स एज वेल अमीनोग्लाइकोसाइड्स न्यूमाइस एंड ऑल दैट एंड पैक्स ई एक्सएल फॉर रेसिस्टेंट केसेस विच इज फोटो एक्टिव क्रोमोफोर फॉर इन्फेक्शियस कैरेटाइटिस एंड कॉर्नियल क्रॉस लिंकिंग ओके सर्जिकल यू कैन यूज यू कैन डू पेनेट्रेटिंग कैरेटोप्लास्टी इफ इट इज वेरी सिक्योर एंड देन दीज आर सर्टन वन लाइनर्स many questions will be asked from them and uh, you have conditions where you see visible corneal nerves which are enlarged and visible but again visible but not enlarged and stuff like that so investigations related to the cornea you have stuff like keratometry pachymetry specular microscopy confocal microscopy gonioscopy all these things and where do you see cast strings cornea vertical data iron lines all of that ओके कॉर्नियल डीजेनरेशन अगेन मोस्टली कैलसीफाइड डीजेनरेशन बैंड शेप कैरेटोपति इज इंपॉर्टेंट सो यू दर इज स्विस् चीज अपियरेंस ऑफ कैलशियम डिपॉजिट्स एट द वोमेंस लेयर ओके ऑल दीज कॉसेस आर देर यू कैन रीड दैट कैरेटोकोनस इज वन मोर इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग ओके सो कैरेटोकोनस इज अ प्रोग्रेसिव नॉन इन्फ्लोमेटरी डीजेनरेशन ऑफ द सेंट्रल कॉर्निया विच रिजल्ट इन एक्टेटिस सो कैरेटो कॉर्निया इज कोनस सो कॉनिकल इट एक्टेटिस इट बल्जेस आउट so there is bulging of the inferior paracentral cornea and there is corneal thinning so the investigation of choice is corneal topography what is the basic pathology in keratoconus so there is weakening or decrease in the covalent bonds between the stromal collagen okay so what are the clinical features see the patient he keeps frequently changing the glasses so the patient's uh, in between teenage to his 30s or something like that he keeps changing his glasses frequently because there is ectatic bulging of the cornea the nor- the cornea keeps bulging 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 and each time the cornea bulges slightly the refractive index changes so the visual power changes okay so that is why the person keeps changing his glasses frequently and then there is astigmatism as well this also contributes to the refractive error so curvatural myopia it results in myopic astigmatism and again it causes irregular astigmatism so what are the signs so signs again you have scissoring reflex on retinoscopy so that is the earliest clinical sign of keratoconus you can you have a yawning reflex on retinoscopy oil droplet reflex on distant direct ophthalmoscopy see oil droplet reflex is different from oil globular reflex okay just keep that in mind so what are the named signs so you have flesher's link which is iron at the base of the cone at the epith- uh, epithelium and then you have munson's sign v shaped in uh, indentation of the lower lid on down gaze and vogt stray so that is a vertical tear of the desmets membrane other signs you have acute eye drops so there is accumulation of acus in the stroma and epical scarring glaucoma so my mnemonic to remember the important signs in keratoconus is famous f a m o v s okay so f for flesher's ring A for acute eye drops, M for Munson sign, O for oil droplet reflex, T for Wood's lines or the Wood's tray, and S for scissoring reflex. Okay, so again, all of these are the investigations. So the placido disc examination it shows irregularity of the circles. Okay, as you can see here, so there is irregularity of the circles in a placido disc examination. This is a basic diagram for keratoconus. Okay, you have all these factors and stuff. The theory, the majority of the theory you can go through on your own. so all that on retinoscopy you can see a yawning reflex or a scissoring reflex and uh, on distant direct ophthalmoscopy ddo you can see uh, oil droplet reflex lemer as charlo sign munson sign which is localized bulging of the lower lid when the patient looks down because the cornea is bulged out so when the patient looks down the lid the cornea goes under the lid and the bulged cornea causes the lid also to bulge out this is called munson sign 
Next is the Rizzuti sign or the phenomenon. So when you uh, project a pen, uh, pen light onto the cornea from the temporal side, a bright focus of light is seen at the nasal limbus. This is called the Rizzuti phenomenon. Okay, the Rizzuti sign. A bright focus of light at the nasal limbus. Next, again, keratometry, the corneal topography, all, all that you can see. Again, you have grading, keratometry-based grading of keratoconus, so mild, moderate, and severe based on 48 to 54 diopters, and morphological classification, which is nipple, oval, and globus based on the cone. Okay, also have keratoconus posterior, which is in very rare condition, so that's probably something you'd want to mention in your cold mill examinations and stuff. So again, treatment of keratoconus. So treatment of choice is C3R, which is corneal collagen crosslinking C3, corneal collagen crosslinking CCC, R, riboflavin. So basically, you are producing new collagen uh, bonds and strengthening the existing collagen bonds and between the collagen bundles and the stoma. Okay, and riboflavin eye drops plus the UVA, so you ultraviolet A light, it causes photopolymerization. So this arrests further progression of the keratoconus, further thinning of the cornea. Next, use uh, cylinders, cylindrical glasses, and then contact lens. So early keratoconus, you use toric contact lens. Advanced keratoconus, there is irregular astigmatism. So you use RGP contact lens, so rigid gas permeable contact lens. Then you can use ICRS, which are intracorneal ring segments. So they're made of polymethyl methacrylate PMMA. The, uh, you insert them in the mid peripheral stroma and they're reversible, okay? For apical scarring, when there is scarring, you, you have to do keratoplasty because the cornea is fibrosed. There is scarring. So again, you have to replace that with transparent donor cornea. So full thickness penetrating keratoplasty can be done or DALC. So deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty can also be done. So moving on to corneal dystrophies. So you have many dystrophies. You can just remember the classification, the definition and the classification of these corneal dystrophies. So epithelial, you have Kogan's dystrophy and Meesman's uh, dystrophy. Bowman's again, B for B is Buckler dystrophy and Thiel Binke uh, dystrophy. Stromal again, you have macular, granular, uh, lattice and Schneider's and endothelial, so Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, that is important. Ched and PPMD are not that important. So what you do need to remember about Kogan's dystrophy it is, is that it is due to an abnormality in the hemidesmosomes, which are epithelial basement membrane uh, attaching molecules. So that uh, it is an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. So again, you see a fingerprint map dot dystrophy, fingerprint map dot dystrophy. So again, you use NDAG laser therapy. So stromal dystrophies, you just need to remember the strains and uh, the mode of inheritance and stuff that is for the MCQs. But for theory, I don't think it is that important. Okay, then Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, that is important again. So it is the most common endothelial dystrophy. It presents later in life. So I like to remember it as endothelial gut data with epithelial bullae. So if this is the epithelium and the endothelium of the cornea, so you have endothelial gut data, which gives a beater metal appearance on specular microscopy, beater metal appearance because of the gut data on specular microscopy and bullae on the epithelium. So epithelial bullae plus endothelial gut data. That is all about uh, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy that you need to remember. Then you see stromal edema also. Bullae, edema, gut data. Next you can have bullous keratopathy and it's a very painful condition. So what are the other causes of bullous keratopathy you can have? Uh, so this occurs after cataract surgery, it occurs in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy and it occurs because of silicone oil usage in the eye. And you can ha you have all these other things. But one important thing which you need to remember in this chapter is all the DDs for uh, cloudy cornea or congenital cl uh, cloudy cornea. So you have the mnemonic is stumped. So S is for sclerocornea. T is for trauma or any tears of the decimates membrane as in a forceps delivery. U is for uterine infection. So especially rubella in, in the torch panel. So rubella it causes interstitial keratitis. So that is something that you need to remember next m is for mucopolysaccharidosis so mps all right and then uh mucopolysaccharidosis except hunter syndrome then p is for peter's anomaly which is corneal obesity plus congenital cataract it is due to failure of the separation of lens vesicle from the surface ectoderm during developmental stages and e is for endothelial dystrophy and d again is for dermoid as well choristoma so leash nodules they're hematomas they are just that's just an additional point okay one uh, high yield in uh, point is about the golden heart syndrome which is ocular auricular and vertebral disorder so there is an abnormality in the first and second branchial arch uh, derivatives so there is a limbal dermoid external ear deformities 
uh, you can have pre auricular skin tags there is maxillary hypoplasia and hemi vertebrae so a few other important points which i think deserve mention are about marginal keratolysis or peripheral ulcer ulcerative keratitis associated with connective tissue diseases so again in the name itself you have association with connective tissue diseases which include rheumatoid arthritis sle pan uh, uh, and uh, vaginal granulomatosis with polyangiitis all that all right the clinical features see there is a, a guttering guttering or thinning of the peripheral cornea melting of the peripheral cornea corneal ulceration all this you can have so treatment again topical medication with antibiotics cycloplegics again to re reduce the pain and increase the healing systemic medication for immu uh, such as immunosuppressants all that muren ulcer it's a chronic serpiginous or rodent ulcer it is a severe inflammatory peripheral ulcerative keratitis so again most probably it is autoimmune in nature so it can be benign or uh, it can be very virulent so there can uh, you can have a severe pain photophobia lacrimation and defective vision so again it is a superficial ulcer it starts at the corneal margin okay it fall uh, forms a shallow uh, furrow over the entire cornea so it is a peripheral ulcer it is associated with undermining of the epithelium and characteristic white overhanging edge okay so you, you have all that and treatment again topical corticosteroids because you don't know what's happening autoimmune you're suspecting give steroids and immunosuppressive therapy all right so you have all these things again uh, yeah moving on to interstitial keratitis i think that deserves some mention so interstitial keratitis so again etiology you have viral causes such as hsv hzv all this bacterial causes such as tb syphilis lyme disease uh, lymphogranuloma venereum leprosy all the mostly all the granulomatous lesions other such as sarcoidosis again granulomatous onchocerciasis or river blindness kogan syndrome all that so especially syphilitic uh, lesions they result in interstitial keratitis so congenital it is most oftenly uh, most often associated with congenital syphilis than acquired syphilis so it is generally accepted that the disease is a manifestation of local antigen antibody reaction all right so first streptonema pallidum the causative organism of syphilis invades the cornea and sensitizes it and later there is small scale fresh invasion and uh, this excites the inflammation in the sensitized cornea so then you have hutchinson's triad this includes interst uh, interstitial keratitis in the eye hutchinson's teeth and vestibular deafness okay so you have the initial progressive stage so there is ground glass appearance here again symptoms are same pain lacrimation photophobia breathless spasm all that florid stage so you have salmon patch appearance so glass then a salmon fish and stage of regression so you have ghost vessels so that's just something i used to remember so first you have glass in a glass plate you are serving somebody a salmon fish and once he eats that he gets poisoned due to food poisoning or something and he dies so there's a ghost so ghost vessels so diagnosis again vdrl test or treponema pallidum immobilization test all that so local treatment again local corticosteroid drops to control the inflammation atropine eye ointment dark goggles keratoplasty systemic treatment and in tuberculosis interstitial keratitis all that it is not very necessary and corneal degenerations i think arcus senilis arcus juvenilis all these they deserve some mention but again i don't think it it's that important for the exams uh, calcific degeneration again bsk is very important so see, you can see here there's a clear interval till the limbus okay and you can see uh, band shaped keratopathy in the interpalpebral zone so the swiss cheese appearance so the surface is stippled with holes okay uh, because in the calcium plex in the bowman's membrane okay so all that i think we have discussed corneal dystrophy so all this is fine i guess so again the stages of fuchs endothelial dystrophy stages of cutata formation stage of edema stage of bullous keratopathy and stage of scarring gps and uh, i think that is fine so one last thing that deserves mention in this chapter is uh, corneal surgery so again uh, you have autokeratoplasty and uh, allografting or allokeratoplasty so autokeratoplasty is when you are using the same person's cornea or uh, 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 when you are using the same person as the donor and the recipient so there can be rotational keratoplasty in which the patient's own cornea is trephined and rotated to transfer the pupillary area having a small corneal opacity to the periphery and then contralateral keratoplasty is indicated when cornea of one eye of the patient is opaque and the other eye is blind due to some disease with a clear cornea so from the blind eye 
you're taking the cornea which is clear and putting it in a in the other eye which has a corneal defect allografting or allokeratoplasty so you have penetrating and lamellar keratoplasty lamellar again you have anterior lamellar and posterior lamellar in anterior lamellar again you have salk and dalk superficial anterior and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in posterior lamellar keratoplasty you have dsek which is desmid stripping endothelial keratoplasty dsaek automated and pre dsaek okay so indications again you have optical indications to improve the vision therapeutic indications to replace the inflamed cornea tectonic grafts to restore the integrity of the eyeball and cosmetic indications to improve the appearance of the eye so again surgical technique is you excise the donor button first the donor button you uh, remove that and then excise the recipient button so remove the sa almost the same size of the recipient as well and you replace the uh, replace both of them and you suture it that's it and you have early complications such as uh, infection of the graft secondary glaucoma flat anterior chamber epithelial defects and graft failure obviously which is the most dreaded thing and late complications again graft rejection that is also very dreaded and recurrence of the disease and astigmatism okay then graft rejection you see stuff like cutaduced lines and uh, uh, stromal rejection with case dot uh, sorry with sudden onset stromal haze sub epithelial case dots okay all this so case dots cutaduced lines keratic precipitates with edema in the stroma all of this is an indication of graft rejection so again evaluation of the donor tissue and the medium for cor uh, corneal preservation is important which is macari kaufman medium okay you use the moist chamber method till 24 hours mk medium okay so you don't need to remember the composition i think but uh, the time period is important okay then you have intermediate uh, term storage up to two weeks you have optisol solution long term preservation methods so cryopreservation okay you have other uh, surgeries i don't think that is much needed all these osteodontoprosthesis and stuff like that